was a very appropriate spiritual song, wasn't it, for considering our message this morning. I'm going to read to you a statement from Jeremiah 45. Baruch was Jeremiah's secretary, he labored with him. Uh, he was trusted, trusted so much that Jeremiah could send him out into the temple area. Trust him to be faithful because Jeremiah was, was uh, forbidden to enter the temple area. He was such a troublemaker with his message. The authorities refused to allow him to enter, but Baruch could enter, and he could read the same message in the same word. Of course, everything, everything was falling down around them, literally everything. We have Jeremiah's lamentation at the loss, the great loss of all that God had done and all his will and purpose for his people there in that place where he had put his name, where uh, David had received the instructions to build that magnificent temple. Solomon had finished that work. God had said to him, you'll not build a house for me, but your son shall build a house for me. And now here, four centuries later, God, after entering into it, remember Ezekiel had the vision, I think it's in chapter 9 or 10, of the presence of God leaving that holy place, hesitating, passing some more, hesitating, distancing himself some more and hesitating as the heart of God surely was broken that now this time had come. One of the prophets there in 2 Chronicles 36, things verses 15 and 16, says that, that the people were rebellious and sinful until there was no remedy. God sent his prophets. He warned them again and again there was no remedy. And here Jeremiah and Baruch were in the midst of this. There was likely uh, a few other righteous people. Most of them had been taken away. Many of those who had been taken away were still not righteous. You remember the, the elders who came to Ezekiel and God said, I'll not be inquired of by you. I'm not going to answer any of your questions. But there were some, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, Ezekiel himself. Here we've got Jeremiah and Baruch still in Jerusalem. Everything is falling down. The armies of Nebuchadnezzar surrounding the city uh, the people continuing in their wickedness. And Baruch says, woe is me. Now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing. I find no rest. God said to the prophet, thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord. Behold, what I have built... I will break down. What I have planted, I will pluck up. That is, this whole land. Do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places, wherever you go. Well, brethren, we come to this table to remember we have nothing that can be salvaged out of this world, not even out of ourselves. But because of the power of our Savior's life and that, as Brother Tony's focus text says, he became sin for us, we have the righteousness of God in him. That's life for us. And that's all we that's all we're going to get out of this world with. That's the only possession we're going to have when it's all said and done. Baruch labored with Jeremiah, knew the message, was faithful in his charge. Alone sometimes the, the prophet had to remain in hiding. Baruch didn't know is God going to give me the same protection he's given Jeremiah, and he probably knew that Jeremiah's life 
had been, they'd attempted three or four times. Some of even Jeremiah's own family had attempted to assassinate him. God says, you'll, you'll have your life in the end. You won't have anything else because I'm removing it all. All flesh, I'll bring adversity on all flesh. You'll have your life. Well, that's what we remember here at this table. That God is, has, has brought adversity on all flesh. He, it, it is his enemy. He's bringing it down. Yeah. Now, by faith, we know that he already has. And so we've abandoned our own flesh. In the hearing of this good news, we've abandoned our own flesh, abandoned our own life, realizing that there's no life in the flesh. It's corrupt and dead. And God has, God has granted us to this, this revelation, this realization, and we're seeing more of it all the time. We see the largeness of this, the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of it, even as we look into this enormity of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And we've learned, haven't we? There's not just love for us that's contained in it, but it's much larger even than that. In his righteousness and his holiness, his love for the truth. Now, he will not abandon himself. And so this is why he's brought this adversity on all flesh to remove it from his presence. The end of all flesh has come before me, he said to Noah. So we have that testimony of it, don't we? And it's referred to again and again and again through the scripture. But Ezekiel, God reaches back to the days of Noah to give an example how bad things had gotten. If Noah and Job and Daniel were in this city of Jerusalem, they would save only themselves. They'd only get out with their lives. They wouldn't even save their own children. That's how bad it had gotten in Jerusalem. And, of course, we know that was the place. The place where the price was paid in full. And it was finished. where he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, took upon him the iniquity of many, and carried it away and returned again. So this vast truth we remember, and we think on as we come to the table in communion with him and with one another. Let's pray together. Father, we bless your name.